we have amazing stories here at NASA, but those stories only get listened to if somebody tells them and kind of actually makes them come alive. And that's why it's so important that you are here and uh, you find the angle that's most exciting uh, because that's why we think it's so important to have you here as opposed to us trying to translate into every one of those aspects that could be of interest. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, the Associate Administrator for Science. So kind of in round numbers, that's uh, right now 106 missions. Uh, some of them are in space. Uh, many of them are, uh, you know, still in development. You know, uh, some of them just are in the design stage, like some drawing somewhere, a good calculation somewhere else. And some of them are in operation. They're providing the data right now that really shapes our understanding of nature itself. Uh, the, the missions that we have really fall into three categories, and all of them sometimes keep, you know, actually check more than one of those boxes. The first one is we learn about the secrets of the universe, right? Kind of, uh, the way you think about this, uh, we live in a space of what we know. On the outside is darkness. There's a space that we don't know. Uh, and uh, what we do here at NASA is enlarge the space in which we live and think. Every once in a while we learn, I mean, in every mission we learn new things. We learn entirely new things about the Earth, for example, about the Moon, about planets, about the space in between, the Sun, other stars, planets elsewhere, the deep universe. We learn new things. There are questions, however, that are so new that they not only are new things, but they, they entirely make us think in a different way. So it's not about learning more, it's about entirely thinking differently. And I believe, actually, the mission that we're dealing with, and that really relates to the second box, it's about finding life elsewhere, is, is a series of missions that, that are doing just that right now. They're revolutionizing the, the way we think about life itself. Because for the first time in history, we can deal with that question, not in a philosophic way only, but in a scientific way. Like, how do we actually go find places where life could exist? How do we figure out as we go forward whether these atmospheres show signs <laughs> of these planets, show signs of uh, water, show signs of life, and uh, you know, a path forward that we don't even know how to ask the questions yet scientifically. So that's TESS is right in the middle of that story arc, I would believe. A story arc that, uh, by the way, the third one, is about protecting and improving life on Earth. Uh, I think it's absolutely amazing that there's many of our uh, missions that affect our life right now. The last time I stood here was when we launched GOES S, which will provide weather forecasts over the entire west coast of the United States and beyond. Uh, other countries are going to use it too. Uh, GOES R, which we launched, which is 16, GOES 16, 17, uh, we launched uh, last year, is already providing the weather forecast of where I live, which is in Washington, D.C. So, so that's the third one. But let's go back to that story or kind of in, in uh, uh, finding life elsewhere. So my PhD in astrophysics is in 96. Not particularly important, but but what's important is uh, uh, that if you taught astrophysics today, which is entirely differently than how we taught astrophysics in 95, 94, where I sat in these kind of classes. Because in 95, what happened is this crazy announcement in a conference in Rome of the two first exoplanets. By the way, half the community thought they were wrong, the people who announced it, <laughs> because there was theories that said that Jupiter-type planets could not be that close to stars. Theories predicted that, well, all these theories were, are dead. They're all wrong. Many of the theories about planetary systems died that day, and many of them have died in the meantime. And that's what happens if you go from n equals one, one solar system, to observing hundreds of stellar systems that of course have the same physics, the same, the same kind of uh, uh, processes that get, get us there. And so, so the question that we have in our minds is, you know, like, okay, so as we go forward, we made all these uh, discoveries, we found, uh, you know, planetary systems just as big, one of them, just as, as many planets as ours. Uh, we of course found the Trappist system, you know, with three uh, planets in the habitable zone. 
And so this uh, mission is really right at that interface, I would argue, really shining out the, you know, the space near us in an astrophysical sense, in our neighborhood to really find uh, those worlds. So for me, that's only one of many missions that do just that. Uh, some of these missions, by the way, are in the solar system. Uh, we think that Mars has a really interesting history that we may see elsewhere in the, in the stars uh, with planets there uh, that was a lot wetter than it is today. I want to bring those samples back. We're actually going to launch uh, we're, uh, in just a few weeks, um, May 5th, uh, the window opens to uh, uh, do the first ge geologic exploration of Mars, kind of really see what's underneath the surface in a way. And so, so, but to bring the samples back with uh, Mars 2020 and then what's coming behind it is the next big milestone. We're of course already looking at Europa and we're looking at other worlds out there that we never thought of until the late 90s uh, and kind of early 2000s because there's oceans out there. And so we're looking at this. There's a lot of biology that happens that I don't happen to fund out of our program. It's really important though. Uh, synthetic biology, really understanding kind of the, the interface between chemistry and biology, complex chemistry. There's this, there's a lot of darkness in our understanding that we don't know how to do that, but that's also important. All together, this mission uh, that we're gonna launch today, assuming the wind dies down a little bit and we're a little bit lucky, we always need luck. Uh, 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 this mission will be, I think, together with the other missions that we have and other knowledge we're getting, really making history because of the fact that it's uh, right in the middle of one of the most exciting, one of the most important questions that we're addressing right now in which we're making progress at the speed that there's actually not many questions out there in which we're making progress at that amazing speed. So you're part of uh, history being made right now and I'm uh, really glad uh, that you're uh, that you're here. So what I'm going to do is actually stop and let you drive. What do you want to talk about? Does that make sense? But that only works if you ask questions. <laughs> All right, I'll start in the back. Where is Europa on your priority list? And what type of technology are you developing? Europa is high. So in the planetary sciences, where uh, Europa, I shouldn't put this in front of your camera. Uh, in the planetary sciences, where Europa is uh, located, <laughs> right? So you remember, of course, like, I just talked to you about multiple fields that all belong together in one question. So it's actually a challenge for us. How do we do the science across these disciplines? But in that planetary uh, sciences, Europa and Mars sample return are the highest priority. So uh, uh, right now we're uh, working on a Europa Clipper mission, which is really an imager sensing type of mission. And we're already thinking about landing uh, on uh, uh, on uh, Europa too. That the kind of technologies we're developing on the one hand are uh, really system technologies. Remember, Europa is in the worst environment in the entire solar system. It's even less radiation near the sun than it is next to Jupiter because of its radiation bulbs. It's a horrible environment. So we want to make sure that the systems work in that environment. There's a lot of instruments we're developing for that. The other thing we're doing though also is focusing tremendously on developing sensors, instruments that work in space that are actually there to explore that complex chemistry biology interface. Some of them focus are focused on really sophisticated mass specs and chromatographs, you know, that the kind of stuff that you need to do that, you know, are in labs, in hospitals or in kind of advanced chemistry labs. Some of them are just looking at morphology microscopes, looking for, uh, you know, signatures of, of uh, you know, ancient life uh, or, or current life, you know, looking at that and everything in between. So, so uh, the technologies for those instruments we're really inventing right now. I would argue that's uh, one of the most uh, important parts together with, of course, uh, the system technology, autonomous landing, you know, Europa, you can't joystick land, right? I mean, you can't do it on Mars either, but light is too slow. You know what I mean? Like, so, so, so you, it needs to be autonomous. You just like wait until it calls you back and says everything went fine. And so kind of the technologies for that in that horrible radiation environment is really hard, but we have the best people working on it, both within NASA, but also in industry. Yeah. Um, if funding wasn't a question, what's the mission that you'd love to see happen? Well, 
after a test house is where to go, I would like to do an interstellar probe. I'd like to go visit that star. I think our, your generation, our generation, should do something like that. Really, kind of make a big tent in kind of the bubble in which we live. So, so if funding was not an objective, I would like to travel, learn how to travel to other stars. Yeah. If we find signs of microbial life on Mars, how do you think that's going to change the science goals? How how is it going to change that? Change like the science goals and the missions that come. Wow. Out? it would have a major impact, right? So the first question we would ask, is it the same life as our life? Remember, uh, we're exchanging stuff, Mars and the Earth, right? There's rocks from Mars that are here, and you know, there's without doubt rocks from Earth that are on Mars, right? Because uh, if there's collisions, these cosmic collisions, uh, rocks fly off in all directions, some of them go back and forth. So the question is, is it the same life? If it's the same life, that's kind of cool. If it's different life, it's way more interesting. <laughs> so the reason the reason uh, Europa is so exciting as a place is because it's probably different life. We don't really exchange, you know, if Jupiter is too heavy, it shields everybody, right? It, it would be very hard to imagine that we have the same life. So even if, it, if it's the, the same life as the Earth, it would be very interesting because it would have undergone very different evolution, right? So, so we would really learn about the kind of entire adaptability of life in a way that we haven't see the big story of adaptability here on earth is amazing right kind of in a permafrost in siberia you know next to next to a fence uh, below the ocean you know life is very adaptable but it's one life n equals one that's our everything we know about life is n equals one one life in its many forms so so that's the big question, right? We would ask, like, is it different? Is it the same? It's important no matter what, and it would really shift our resources there because what we would basically say, hey, you know, is it ancient life? Is there any chance this thing is still around, you know? And, and so for us, I'm sure it would be one of the most profound discoveries that would shape uh, science for the future. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. If it is different life, do you think that, like, ethically we're allowed to go and Well, so this is one of the things, you know, we always worry about as scientists, you know, which is that we never want to destroy an experiment, right? But we have to a little bit. So kind of that, actually the question that you're asking is actually a really hard question because the answer is not yes or no. It's the answer is to a certain extent, yes, right? So, so we would want to uh, go there and learn about it, but we would want to make sure that we don't prevent future generations from learning. So I'm sure there will be some constructs we will come up with that we're using on Earth too, right? In which we fence things off and say, here's a natural park, a, a, a national park, or some kind of reserve. We're not going to go mess around there, right? The only people allowed are, if you want, scientists, or, you know, people, not, not, you can't build a factory there to extract something, you know? And so, so, so it's these kind of constructs we would use there too, right? But, but frankly, you know, some people have thought about it, but not at the level of intensity that we would have to once we see that because it becomes the prime question how do we make sure we can really explore that without you know bringing our own life there containing the entire story super interesting question i'm gonna go here hang on put the hand up those who have the top one two three four okay go what kind of projects that are in progress right now are you looking for that so on the sensing side, uh, James Webb is the big thing we're working on, right? A six and a half meter uh, telescope uh, at very, very cold temperatures. This is the follow up uh, mission that will look at whatever we see on test, right? Kind of web will come behind it. I'm sure whatever is discovered with this mission that we're launching today will drive what, uh, what web is gonna do. But it's a te it's technologies we now know. Uh, yes, uh, there are uh, entirely new sensing technologies that are uh, already being developed in a variety of areas, but also platform technologies of the time that you're talking about. Enhanced propulsion will make a huge difference uh, right for even for human exploration, right? We try to make sure we go to Mars a lot faster than 
a regular home on orbit, right? Which takes the, the months it takes. Uh, and, and so we can go much faster. It, 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 it would be easy for us, but especially if we wanted to do my dream mission, which is to go beyond the solar system. We want kind of faster is better, right? Because we want to make this a single generation mission, not, not 40 years until you see something cool, right? I mean, you want to go into, on, uh, into uh, uh, areas we haven't discovered yet. We have never been to quickly. And so, uh, you know, uh, whatever the propulsion are, some of them are actually power technologies, uh, whether it's uh, focused on nuclear or radiation pressure type of uh, technologies that are out there. Some of them are, are um, you know, propulsion technologies of the type that, that uh, you, uh, you talked about. But, you know, so the, as you go, right, you'd like to, you'd like to uh, push forward in each one of the dimensions. Some of the Earth observations, actually, bigger is not better, smaller is better. And the simple reason for that is that you'd like, kind of, when a spacecraft goes behind the horizon, the next spacecraft to be up, but that requires many spacecraft, right? So, so for us, learning how to mass produce some of them, uh, much of that will happen in industry, right? For, for it already is happening with Planet and other companies that are there. So there's other dimensions, but for, for some of these big uh, missions that are out there, yeah, it is propulsion, it is sensors, and it is uh, power uh, type of uh, technologies that are there. Who was number two? There, yeah, me. What happens if we stumble upon intelligent life, either in the near future or even years down the road, we're uh, searching for life, but if we find people that are smarter, smarter than us? I'd like to be a NASA when that happens. Some of the great combined of our generation or whatever, uh, like Mr. Hoffman or whatever. Sure, yeah, I mean, you know, can that, that maybe that wasn't, had to be bad. So I, I uh, you know, I, I have, you know, in the science community, I've made, I've asked questions like this. Who thinks that there's, we're the only intelligent life? You know, there's not many people. There are some, by the way. Really? There are some. There are some, you know, but, but there's not that many. And so it's a matter of time if they are right, if the majority is right. By the way, science is not a democratic sport, it turns out. <laughs> you could be the only, the only true correct voice and people could fight you for 30 years. You're still right if the experiment gives you right after, after some of many, many years. You know, some of Einstein's predictions, highly controversial, some of them were, you know, confirmed 100 years after his, he made the predictions and every in and, and some of the predictions he actually made up the predictions to prove that somebody else was wrong so he said if they're right this will happen it's like well it's there right uh, so I don't know what what will happen right it's it, the question that you're asking is not so much a question of science only it's really a question of society a question of psychology religion in some cases it it shakes everything, it shakes the foundation of the world we live in, our psychological world, right? Is it a threat? You know, of course, some pessimists may think, like, well, that's the end of humanity. Is it a blessing? You know, some optimists may think, you know, many of the problems that we struck, that, that we have here, perhaps they have the solutions to it, right? And I don't know, we, we don't know. So there's a lot of ambiguity in that question, but uh, I would like to be at NASA when that happens. So let me know who's number three. Yeah. Fossils on Mars. Are we looking for fossils on Mars? And what would be your bet personally for finding life in our lifetime? <clears throat> I always wonder when you say our, what do you mean? Like I look at the kind of distribution of uh, 30 years. age and the, yeah, yeah, right. Let's see. Um, I think it's significant. I don't think it's zero. I don't, I, I, look, I don't know. As a scientist, my answer has to be, I don't know. Because I don't know. There's no algorithm to determine. Like, I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's absolutely realistic to assume that something like that can happen in the next decades. And then the reason for that is it's just the speed at which we're making progress. Like, I did my PhD a year before, I mean, a year after, a few months after the first planet was announced look where we are today go check how many planets we have look what we know about these planets look about the planets in the habitable zone look at 
what we learned it within the solar system every single parameter in that famous drake equation you know that relates to astrophysics mm -hmm. and planetary sciences is up every one of them right there's more finding water somewhere else is much more likely than we thought when i went to school mm -hmm. right it's like so everyone is up and so i just look at trends you know that get as a scientist that's what i do mm -hmm. and where exactly is the bar like we don't know that's that's what discovery is all about we we tap forward without knowing right but is it like is it possible yeah we're really bad at predicting and over long time scales we're actually mostly in many of these questions we overestimate the time it takes so i would not be surprised if there's a discussion in our lifetimes in which we basically say hey we found this is it intelligent life i think that's another st mm. now there's way more ambiguity on this one what i'm really talking about mm. is is that you know either extinct life life on mars or perhaps even a life that's you know out there in other systems like Europa or Enceladus or elsewhere. If we were having a bet, I would put it on fossils on Mars. All right. <laughs> you remember that guy. Bad with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, if I remember right, um, TESS is a class Class C mission for you. With, with SpaceX, if they're targeting being uh, certified for B or A, Will their lower cost of access to space change your architecture for flagship missions? Yes. You can send three Falcon Heavies to do things. Yes. Uh, with more redundancy. See, it already has. Kind of for, for us to, I mean, we think that the competition in the launch market that's out there, yes. whether it's this company or many of the others, is a really positive thing for science. Because we actually have a series of products. Some of them are just coming online, even smaller. Uh, launch vehicles are coming online mm -hmm. some of them even bigger right uh, mm -hmm. you know um, that kind of uh, competition there has o over time already driven down the cost of, of uh, launch for some of our systems and if if at the higher complexity uh, mm -hmm. type of uh, missions we can really do that especially if also with going with astronauts and robots to actually assemble uh, spacecraft is also possible mm -hmm. cheaper right there's a set of options that are opening up that are really incredible not everything should be from space by the way uh, I think astrophysics is especially a field in which ground-based and space-based increasingly work together I would argue that there's not many real science questions that are where the answer is only either in space or on the ground I mean you're gonna see a lot you already see now but you're gonna see a lot of advances in ground-based uh, observations as well that will go hand in glove with the space can based ones of course you know infrared doesn't really get to the ground but visible does and you can make much bigger buckets right now on the ground you know every photon counts if you want to mm -hmm. uh, kind of deal with some of the uh the you know fainter sources that we just talked about so mm -hmm. so uh yeah it will it will have an impact in uh and uh, it will have an impact for uh, systems that are out there that you know we haven't invented yet i mean what really happens is the kind of question that you're asking is kind of an unlocking type of answer you know kind of you, you don't like it's not like you know innovation is not a linear process in which you just kind of move on a linear thing like a new opportunity comes available and a whole set of great ideas come up including the one from tests right it's a great idea with that pi i'm sure you've you're meeting him uh, if you haven't or, or his team you know it's a great idea that has been put into a mission that you know 10 years ago nobody would have had you need the other knowledge and all of a sudden this technology becomes available and you can answer a question that otherwise you couldn't have so it's of, of that nature i think it will be profound but i don't know in what way last question right here oh, okay last question go ahead you had mentioned So the way I would interpret your question is uh, what we're doing actually a lot 
enough, even around hydrothermal vents or otherwise, is to, to really look at what we see on Earth, analogs on Earth, like hydrothermal vents under observations, under ice uh, covers, and we're trying really hard to learn how to function in those kind of environments. So we learn how to transport that environment elsewhere. What we try to do is when we go to a place where we suspect that there's life, we actually do a lot, a lot of work that we're not bringing anything that's alive. We try to bring not a single spore with us there. The simple reason for that is we don't want to rediscover our life. We want to discover the other life. And you know, all of science is not just about signal. It's about signal to noise. And we're the noise in this one. Right? And so for us, what we're actually trying to do is never bring anything alive to a place where we want to discover life. Life that's different than ours. But yeah, we want to learn in our environments about how we can discover and where the challenges really are. That we can learn right here. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thanks so much.